good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our webinar on uh, stormwater monitoring. I'm Janice Lansfeld. I'm a product manager at Sontech in San Diego, and um, with me is Kevin Simpson of YSI's Integrated Systems and Services Group, um, who works on stormwater monitoring systems. So the topic of today's webinar is stormwater, which we know can be a pretty complex topic. It can involve things like regulations and compliance it's specific to your organization. It's very geography dependent. Uh, it depends on the experience level of the personnel you have at your disposal and any number of things. So what we'd like to do in this webinar is take this potentially complex subject and break it down into some really understandable components that are going to be common to all stormwater systems. And hopefully with this understanding of these components, you can take this back to your organization and apply it to meet your needs. So yeah, great. Thanks, Janice. Um, so today's objectives, um, obviously we want you to achieve your, your monitoring goals. And, in, and if you do have compliance requirements, uh, meet those as well. Um, so when we move into that, uh, I think the most, one of the most important things is proper site selection. Um, sometimes you have the option to choose where to take these samples within a certain footprint and choosing where to put the equipment and the monitoring uh, system, sampler, et cetera, is probably, probably the most important thing to make sure you're capper, capturing a representative uh, sample of what you're trying to do as well as uh, measure the proper parameters correctly. Um, so we'll talk about the equipment selection and how to set up a system. Um, and, 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 the, and again, probably another important thing would be the reliability of that system so that when you do have a storm event, that you're collecting accurate and reliable data through the entire event, as well as possibly a sample. Um, so we'll also talk about you know, how to handle event-based uh, water sampling and collection using a variety of instruments, uh, data loggers, uh, samplers, so that you can achieve, uh, again, that, that big goal of, of uh, compliance or whatever your monitoring uh, needs are. So we'll start with looking at the urban watershed. Um, you know, that's quite a complex system. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got probably dozens of contributors. We can kind of boil that down to two primary contributors. We've got our point source uh, uh, contributions from municipalities, from industries, etc. And then we've got our non-point source discharge uh, uh, contributors that can come from you know residential lawn mowing, golf courses, uh, all kinds of agricultural. Uh, row crop farming, uh, a variety of things. So this kind of just illustrates the, the complexity of the watershed. I mean, obviously, uh, different parts of the world and different cities have uh, um, probably no two are alike as far as the impermeable surfaces and, and the surrounding industries. But uh, again, this is really just to illustrate the complexity of what's happening and what's contributing to the, the uh, stormwater environment and then ultimately the entire watershed and any adjacent water bodies. Um, so yeah, again, the applications, uh, you know, industri industrial applications would include, uh, you know, manufacturing facilities, transportation facilities, um, and, and in that, you know, you typically look at a common parameter or a common thing to sample for would be metals or anything that's in the manufacturing process that might, uh, might hopefully, uh, hopefully not uh, induce itself into the, uh, the stormwater system. So there's a lot of compliance and regulations surrounding the industrial discharge of the stormwater into the uh, exit of the, of the perimeter of the property. Mm -hmm. Perhaps pH as well. Absolutely. pH would be a big one. And even possibly connectivity when you're looking at uh, uh, no connectivity for hydrocarbon, tough medium, et cetera. Um, and then municipal. Uh, a lot of organizations have not only water and wastewater facilities, but also in a stormwater department where they're looking at their entire county or city from a, a sort of a holistic stormwater program. So they're oftentimes involved in, in uh, monitoring as well as sampling. Um, and there might, might be parameters such as uh, pathogens or nutrients. Nutrients is probably one of the biggest things that influences our, our uh, stormwater and the adjacent water bodies to that. Um, oxygen. Oxygen would be a, a great surrogate to look at that. Um, and construction is another application. In construction, we're usually looking at um, after you unearth the land, whether you're building a new highway or excavating a uh, bridge possibly, et cetera, you're disturbing sort of the natural environment and especially the sediment. So typically in a major construction project and even some minor uh, 
construction projects, you'll put up barriers to contain that sediment. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to ensure that those barriers are working properly and we're inducing none or the minimal amount of uh, additional sediment into those water bodies during a storm event. Um, and then research. Research is another application that's not necessarily compliance driven or regulatory driven, but we're really trying to un understand baselines and targets mm -hmm. um, like right. PMDLs and uh, eutrophication and all kinds of things that the watershed uh, uh, can produce. Um, so yeah, research would be the universities. You could probably even throw some of the environmental consulting firms when they get involved in projects that aren't directly related to the regulatory. So those are the applications. Mm -hmm. um, this is just a sort of a garden variety remote monitoring site. It kind of en encompasses a lots of things, but I wouldn't say that it's uncommon, but it's certainly a, a you know, quite a, an elaborate one that uh, would cover the whole the whole gamut of, mm -hmm. of what we're looking at. First, rain rainfall is probably you know the biggest indicator of a of a stormwater or potential stormwater event, um, and we use a tipping bucket rain gauge um, in this example. Uh, level, as you can see down the bottom of the screen, uh, can be measured several different ways, but level and rainfall correlate very well. And we'll talk about that a little more in the presentation. Whenever you have a significant rain event. There's typically a lag time between when you have a, a, a level rise. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at is that first big runoff and how to capture some good data during that. Uh, the water quality song, uh, you know, wide size been making water quality instruments for 60 years. Um, and these platforms uh, lend itself to a variety of sensors and, and parameters to monitor. Um, in this particular example, we're looking at turbidity, uh, dissolved oxygen pH, connectivity, uh, temperature and uh, and as well as chlorophyll, um, and then a flow meter. You know the hydrology uh, dynamics of of, of stormwater are, are extremely significant, especially in, in smaller open channels and how they contribute to the larger, bigger picture of the model. Um, so measuring flow and understanding those flow characteristics is a big part of stormwater monitoring. In this example, we've got a Sontec side-looking acoustic Doppler profiler. Um, and then bringing all this together into a data acquisition system so that we can not only record the data, but also do logic based on that data. And, uh, and at that point, we can um, uh, look at even sampling. So in order to have the power reserve we need to accomplish all this and to make sure that we're ready for a storm event and then transmit that data successfully, we also include typically a solar power system, especially in these remote uh, outdoor applications. And again, this data acquisition system is going to talk directly to an automated water sampler. And that water sampler can be a, a portable, non-refrigerated or refrigerated. And then again, lastly, we telemetrize that data through a variety of, of cellular options, uh, GO satellite options, um, and then some of the more established alert systems and uh, uh, private uh, licensed UHF, VHF networks. And even SCADA systems, we have the ability to tie to those, those as well, right. using protocols like uh, Modbus, et cetera. I think a nice thing that this picture illustrates is that these are the basic components, and we realize that there's no one-size-fits-all. So your, your solution could include all of these or just a couple of these, but um, based on your needs and your sites, um, yeah, that's correct. These, yeah. these are highly modular. Scalable. It's completely yeah. scalable. In other words, this data acquisition system is extremely affordable. And you may only be looking at, at rain or level and then being triggering samples on that. Yeah. And then you can have the uh, additional sensors later as your program expands. So the consistency and, the, and sort of the standardization behind that lends itself to all kinds of versatilities from multiple manufacturers of sensors and samplers, et cetera. This is just a, a, another uh, project example. It's actually the, the site that we just saw that was uh, animated. This is the, the real version of this project. There's about 28 of these sites in central Florida. And what we're looking at here is, uh, is a big contributor upstream uh, to the TMDL uh, targets and cycle. So upstream of this, uh, actually this particular site, is Orange County or the city of Orlando in Disney World. So we've got golf courses, a ton of non-permeable surface, and uh, this particular location is at the headwaters of the Everglades. So understanding the TMDL, TMDL inflow into your, your uh, specific network or, or your footprint, and then understanding the outflow. So in order to establish a good target, you really have to understand what you're beginning with before it even enters into your system. So 
that you can make to ensure that what's uh, exiting the system is, is optimal. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of what we're working on here. But again, you see the this is just a, a what we call a cabin or a shed that we house everything in. We've got the solar panel atop there. Behind that is the tipping bucket rain gauge. Inside the cabin there is the um, is the refrigerated sampler, the data acquisition system. Um, we've got our level sensor. In this case, it's a shaft encoder, and you can't see the in situ devices, but we actually have the YSI multi-parameter uh, water quality SON as well as the SONTEC SL measuring open channel flow in this canal. This would be a, a sort of a drastic difference, but this would be an example of perimeter runoff. Um, this is actually LaGuardia Airport in New York City. And what we're looking here is, the, is that the wintertime operations, you know, they typically use propylene glycol for some of the flight operations, and we put a network of buoys around the airport to look at dissolved oxygen. So we're measuring uh, year-round for that parameter and looking at if, by chance, there's any deviance or anything beyond what we typically get from the baseline measurement that that propylene glycol might cause. So this is really using dissolved oxygen as a surrogate. Mm -hmm. And propylene glycol is obviously the, the media we're using to de-ice, yeah. or they're using right. to de-ice the plane. So that's a that's sort of a must-have. And LaGuardia Airport's got some unique characteristics in a lot of the runways, even over the adjacent estuary. So is that a single parameter monitoring test? That is. That's our uh, YSI uh, OMS system, which is designed to typically use one of our optical sensors, dissolved oxygen, turbidity, or chlorophyll. In this case, we're using the, the dissolved oxygen mm -hmm. sensor. Yeah, and one of the ISS, or Integrated Systems and Services, uh, buoy there. That's our, actually our smallest buoy. So it's autonomously powered, has a data logger in it, and then transmits that data back to the New York, New Jersey Port Authority. Mm -hmm. Next, we've got uh, just monitoring in general. And we're looking at, uh, typically, again, first and foremost, rainfall and precipitation intensity. So you might have rainfall uh, in, in a totalized formash, uh, formation, or you know, might look at the intensity. In other words, how much rain you have over a certain mm -hmm. time. So typically, you know, looking at intensity is probably the most important thing, because some rainfall events are very light in nature. Right. Right? And they might last a long time, but you don't get that big deluge off of the watershed. And that's typically what a lot of the regulators want to look at. Right. And then you have water level. Um, and then the rate of change of water level, and we talked a little bit about that earlier, um, whenever you do have that significant rain event, there's going to be a rate, rate of change over level. And the lag time between that can vary based on your site and your watershed. It can be from minutes to hours to even days. Um, so understanding your, your site selection and understanding that historical baseline data you get from monitoring can help help those targets and thresholds be determined. And then water quality, we're going to talk about, uh, again, those applications where turbidity, pH, and, and parameters like dissolved oxygen are important and how to measure those properly. Um, and then the hydrology component, flow and open channels, which is probably the most challenging full applications there are because the dynamics and, design, and uh, inherent designs around natural open channels, and then non-full pipes that you would typically mm -hmm. see in the, in the stormwater arena. So we're looking at closely here at our precipitation gauge. This is the design analysis uh, tipping bucket rain gauge. Uh, the resolution, or the, the measurement per tip of that little bucket, is 0 0.01 inches. So every time you get that 0 0.01 inch measurement, it passes a reed switch, which uh, produces a pulse, which your data logger camp, uh, captures and turns into rainfall. Um, this particular rain gauge is an SDI-12 rain gauge, so that pre-processing is done on the rain gauge, and then that data is outputted to the rain gauge. And on the left-hand side there, you can see a typical uh, rain gauge installation and solar panel mount. So a tipping bucket rain gauge installation, you know, the sort of the rule of thumb here is, is that if you do have tree canopies or other buildings that structure, it's to try to be at least two heights away from the nearest tree or building. So if you've got a 25 foot tall tree or a 25 foot tall tree line, you want to be about two heights away from that, in other words, 50 feet. And that will ensure a better rain gauge measurement. And then it needs to be mounted off the ground so you don't get any splashing, mm. et cetera, from the surface. And again, on the right-hand side there, we see the design analysis water log rain gauge um, in a typical uh, open channel. This is actually an open channel application. Open 
shell fuel application. So when we move into water level, we've got several options here. Uh, one of the one one of my favorite is the radar sensor. Uh, design analysis order log makes a a radar sensor that's non-contact, so extremely low maintenance, if any at all. Um, extremely accurate, 0 0.01 foot, which is probably certainly sufficient for most stormwater applications. Um, we also have the ultrasonic uh, sensor um, that's manufactured by MJK. And uh, it's also very similar to the radar sensor, a non-contact sensor with almost no maintenance. Um, but these, these, these sensors do require an overhead structure or a structure adjacent to the water so that they can be mounted to and then look down at the water surface. Um, these sensors include a, an output uh, signal, such as SDI-12, or a discrete analog output, such as 4 to 20 milliamp output. And so they're very friendly with most data acquisition systems. This is a, just a good example of a radar level installation. Um, this is a, a pedestrian walkway over the open channel or the stream, and we're looking down straight at the water surface. So this sensor, again, non-contact and uh, extremely accurate. It can be mounted up to about 130 feet above the water surface and still mm -hmm. get a, a very accurate to a hundredth of a foot level measurement. So for those applications where you have a great uh, sort of active fluctuation, active fluctuation, it's uh, fairly extreme. We can measure that entire range. And then water level um, can also be done uh, through in situ or wetted instruments such as a bubbler. Um, this is the design analysis water log H3553. Um, and then another option there is the pressure transducer. These two are very similar in that they both use pressure transducers. One just so happens to be out of the water and back up at, at your system or data collection right. uh, platform inside the enclosure. So you're using the, the orifice line or the bubble tube to actually enter the water and, and, and the pressure that it takes to exert that bubble out of the end of the tube right. that in turn is measured by a pressure sensor. So these are really good for, for streams that are flashy and that have an extremely dynamic um, uh, shoal line or shoulder to the stream or entrance to the stream. Um, and they don't require that overhead structure or that piling or something to mount right. to. So these are common when you have a what I would consider a very remote natural setting where you're looking at level. Uh, one nice thing about the bubbler is it has that ability to purge the airline right. so that, uh, that that really reduces the maintenance. And even with a pressure sensor, you know, it's fairly low maintenance, but from time to time you need to make sure that it's not buried in the sediment or that any sediment's not blocking that nose cone uh, to get that, um, that sensitive pressure measurement. Right. Again, both very accurate down to a hundredth of a foot, and they also have that SDI-12 signal output. Yeah, any, any number of, of factors could influence what water level measurement Absolutely. method you choose. I mean, there's probably more water level measurement options than, than yeah. <laughs> any yeah. other. Anything from just the, the amount of water you have at the site and whether that's how much is detectable to vandalism at the site. Right, um, right. And, and you're exactly right. By burying this in conduit and keeping it under the water and you have a secure um, system back on shore, then you can kind of minimize, minimize that as well. But nowadays, you know, most of these are extremely accurate. It really comes down to, to how, um, what, what challenges you might encounter at the site for, for installation, right. and which is best suited for that, as well as the maintenance. So this this kind of covers the bubble level uh, installation of the orifice line in an open channel. As you can see the pictures below, this is our services team out installing uh, some orifice lines in rigid conduit. We're actually using a, a galvanized uh, conduit, we're fitting that pipe so that it's a what I would consider an extremely permanent application and well protected from shifting rocks um, and, and vandalism in the public. But, uh, you know, securing it down at the bottom of the channel to make sure that, that during that active fluctuation of level that you cover the low point and it's below the water at all times. But again, above, you know, if you have a soft bottom, you want it to get above that. Right. And then anchoring it secure to the other trip. So. Uh, We've got lots of experience at integrated systems in doing that, and we've got real good documentation in our manuals that will help with that installation. So to water quality, again, YSI has been manufacturing water quality sensors for 60 years. We probably have maybe two and a half, three decades of refinement when it comes to understanding multi-parameter instruments um, as far as uh, maximizing our, our 
anti-fouling characteristics you know, when it comes to cleaning the, the sensors. Um, we're used to being in outdoor applications where we typically even deploy these autonomously, so they're used to, to being run uh, outside of, of uh, uh, discrete samplers or handheld measurements. These are right. really designed for the outdoor environment, and, and they're scalable, completely versatile to what sensors you need at that particular time. And if you don't need that sensor at that particular time, you can remove it and, and store it for the next application. But some of the options, uh, turbidity, again, we talked about that for the construction applications. Right. Uh, pH or some of the industrial applications, um, dissolved oxygen pretty much for all the applications, uh, temperature which is required for, for compensation as well as uh, uh, an ideal parameter, um, connectivity, total algae and chlorophyll. Um, and over on our right hand side here we have our, our YSI 600 OMS and that sensor or that, that instrument is really designed to house and to be a lower cost option if you're looking at just one mm -hmm. of these parameters like turbidity or dissolved oxygen. Um, but also being wiped and very low maintenance. Yeah, Kevin hit on the topic of surrogates earlier, and um, I, did, I wanted to point out also that things like dissolved oxygen and conductivity, they're parameters in and of themselves, but they can be used to be an indicator of other things Absolutely. that you might need to measure, um, even, yeah. even turbidity. Um, surrogate is just what we're measuring, but there's probably a host of other things you could be monitoring just with the parameters that are listed on that page. Correct. Even with like our total algae sensor and chlorophyll sensor, we're using that a lot in some of the surface water applications for, for source water or drinking water to help mm -hmm. predict and treat and, and deter algal blooms. So this is, uh, these sensors have a bit of, bit of an advantage there from the surrogate standpoint. Right. And then again, you know, the basic parameters like dissolved oxygen, temperature, conductivity, and pH are used to just understand the general health of the, the water before and after storm events. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that's the whole purpose behind the water quality uh, multi-parameter instrument. And one more thing about the EXOs, um, that I, particularly for stormwater monitoring, monitoring, which I wanted to hit on, is that they're probably the most rugged sond out there. Absolutely, um, yeah. Full titanium bodies on those sensors. They're welded at the factory. Um, extremely corrosion resistant. Many anti-fouling and corrosion resistant materials go into the, the EXO, which make it an ideal stormwater um, instrument. It's just very rugged. And the output protocols of these are very friendly with other data acquisition sy systems and samplers. So this is, again, this is sort of where we get into the not one size fits all. That's right. Yeah. These are just some examples of installing a water quality sun in a stormwater application. On the left-hand side, this is actually in North Carolina and some of the uh, small tributaries and streams that surround that, that watershed and those headwaters. And this is uh, actually a project um, several years back when they were building a bypass around the city of Charlotte. So they're looking at turbidity here primarily as well as some of those baseline parameters like dissolved oxygen, conductivity, and temperature. But they're using that turbidity measurement to make sure or to ensure that those contractors that are doing the the road constructions and, and that their barriers are doing their job. That if, if they do get breached, that they can come back and repair those barriers so that that sediment uh, doesn't contaminate the water any more than it has to. So in these applications, you might go from something like 20 NTUs, which is a unit we use for turbidity measurement, suspended solids, up to several thousand, you know, um, because of that muddy, silty type mm -hmm. of soil we have um, in that area. And on the right-hand side, um, this is uh, in Brooklyn, um, in this, uh, in, in New York City, we've got several of these sites surrounding the entire uh, metropolitan area. So when you have that many people, you know, I think what is it, five or six million people now in the city, um, maybe more. Um, those, uh, you know, that that's a that's a big contributor to stormwater. The non-permeable surfaces, the traffic, the, the dust industry, et cetera, is all coming into that that small little watershed, the East River, the Hudson River, and eventually out to to Long Island Sound, but we're looking at water quality parameters there too, as well as upstream and downstream of that uh, metropolitan area and reporting that data back uh, to that particular organization. And again, this is just ways of securing the sun. Um, you can see one's more of a natural environment and the, the one on the right there, we've got luxury of, of, a, of a concrete uh, dock and piling that we can secure the instrument. Yeah, through. quite a luxury, huh? Yes, quite a luxury. <laughs> Another example, um, this is a, another airport example. This is a, a marine base in North Carolina where they're looking at uh, the discharge off of, uh, again, a sort of a complex uh, 
tarmac and all the different estuaries around that. As you can see on the upper left there, that's a, that's a, that, that airport is, is directly correlated or directly adjacent to a, an estuary as well as a river, the News River. So um, we, we put out these sites. There's, um, I think, about eight of them. And they're looking at, the, again, the whole gamut. As you can see on the upper right-hand picture here, we've got the rain gauge. We've got our, our enclosure or cabinet that's housing the, the, the automated sampler as well as the data acquisition system. And then underneath here, um, you can see the pipes. We've got the, the YSI exosond, uh, the suction line for the sampler. And then we even have the uh, Sontec open channel flow meter, the uh, Sontec IQ mounted in the culvert here measuring open channel flow. And this data is being reported back to their environmental offices. So yeah, I think Janice here is going to talk about open channel flow and the challenges that, that are inherent yeah. to that. Yeah. Well, what we wanted to do is be, because open channel flow is sort of like the final, the sort of the last puzzle piece, and as Kevin mentioned, sometimes it's, it's the most challenging piece in a stormwater monitoring setup. We wanted to take um, a, a little bit more time to explain the different methods at, at your disposal because perhaps more so in stormwater than in, in other natural situations, there's just a wide variety of, of possible sites. So here you have a concrete line, but you could have a natural um, environment, just like the slide Kevin showed a, a couple slides ago. There's what looks like it's sort of a deep water port um, situation down to sort of a muddy stream. Um, so there's many different uh, situations you could be in, and there are different ways of measuring flow in those situations. So we're going to take a minute and go over some diff different methods. So the first one here on the left, probably the simplest um, as far as instrumentation goes when you're measuring flow is to just measure level. So um, Kevin hit on some of these instruments earlier. It could be radar, it could be ultrasonic, it could be a pressure transducer just anything that measures water level. And when you combine that water level with, say, a flume or a weir and a, an empirical uh, coefficient, you can calculate the flow. But really, um, what I would like to show here is that in the overall picture of things, remember what's going on. You're, you're in the field measuring water level. You're, you're measuring one piece here. The flow is, of course, occurring in the middle of the channel. You could have fast flow in the middle. You could have slower flow. You could have eddies up to the side or whatever. This is what you're measuring. You're measuring water level and we're calculating flow. So um, sort of the next step up, so to speak, is if you're, you're measuring the level, but you're also measuring near the surface a uh, velocity measurement. And there are methods to do that using radar or laser uh, some of them even penetrate a little bit, but still fundamentally what you're doing with ra um, radars and lasers is measuring a near surface velocity and using that as somehow representative of the rest of the flow going on in the whole channel. And again, we're calculating flow with this little bit, little, little bit more information that we have, but there's still what I would call an unmeasured area there. So next, um, what you might want to consider is um, Doppler instruments. And there's, there's two types of Doppler instruments. They fall into two categories. And probably the simplest one is the continuous wave Doppler. And those get mounted in the center of the channel, like, like I show here. And those will measure water level, usually with a pressure sensor. And then the extra piece of information you'll get with a Doppler is Usually they're mounted in the center of the channel, like I showed here. By the way, none of this is really to scale. Um, but you'll get a single measurement of the average velocity in the water column. So these instruments um, just send, send signals out. They'll get information from the top, from the surface. They'll get information from the bottom and the middle. They don't really know where those velocities are, but they'll just spit out an average. Um, and then, of course, to the left and the right, we, we still have an unmeasured area, but you just have that extra piece of information to work with. You know some velocity in the middle. So lastly, um, you have what's called a pulse Doppler. And these are the most sophisticated flow measurement instruments because like a continuous wave Doppler, they, they usually get mounted in the center of a channel. But what I'm trying to show here with those lines is that they will slice the water column into discrete layers. So at each point um, in the water column, 
you have a different velocity measurement. So it's easier to determine what that profile is. So if the water is flowing faster at the surface or in the middle, you'll see that. You'll see where it's faster and slower. And this is extra information to perform a more um, precise, accurate flow calculation. So, and all of this flow is calculated. Yeah, so Janice, I know that in some of these stormer applications, they can be really flashy. So you can go from extremely shallow to no water to a great That's change right. over a lot of time. So these, these cells or these individual things you're talking about, are, are they able to capture that, that fluctuation and that dynamic nature? Yeah, they sure are. At least in the, in the case of Sontex um, IQ, there's a dynamic sensing of the water level. Or even if there's no water, the instrument knows that there's no water. Uh, once there's water on top of the instrument, it will adjust um, how many layers it wants to measure and, and allow the best resolution possible. And also in the case of the Sontec IQ, not all, not all pulse dopplers do this, but the Sontec IQ additionally has beams that look out to the side. So again, you get profile data that kind of help you um, view what's going on out to the edges. And of course, there's still a large unmeasured area where flow is being estimated, calculated. Um, but to the degree we can ascertain real data and apply that to the calculation, we'll, we'd be able to give you a more precise. So the goal, obviously, is to take as many slices as practical mm -hmm. of that cross-section to make sure you're covering representatively what's happening at the edges as well as the center. Right. Yeah. Uh, and lastly, just sort of an, an overview, again, I, we realize there's no one-size-fits-all here, so um, just a comment on, on different shapes. You know, a lot, a lot of us are working in pipes for stormwater discharge. Um, these instruments can handle round pipes, uh, oval pipes, even non-standard sort of composite-shaped pipes. All of that can be programmed into the instrument. It will, it will handle flow calculations accordingly. I threw this picture up here to, to illustrate in the, uh, on the top here that the importance of, of understanding when you're installing a flow measurement device, doesn't matter what it is, um, make sure you understand what the cross-sectional geometry is because that, again, flow is a calculated parameter. Garbage in, garbage out. Yep. So uh, if you measure properly or survey in properly the channel that you're trying to measure in, you will ensure more accurate flow measurement. Right. So looking at that center picture, Janice, I know that, that a lot of times, at least historically, we've used weirs and flumes mm -hmm. in applications, and, and some, and they're certainly great devices. But uh, I guess my question, you know, it, it can get quite complicated when you introduce debris, and that's one concern mm -hmm. people have by using these area velocity meters or debris. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes, those debris, I think, can cause a surcharge condition in a weir or mm -hmm. flume application, especially downstream. Right. So, um, yeah, I think. And at that point, you might have no flow or even reverse flow. Right. So these instruments that we're talking about here, these acoustic or pulse acoustic Doppler right. profilers, they have the ability to to measure forward and reverse flow. That's right. right. Yeah. So there are some some advantages there, especially in the in the dynamic nature of measuring stormwater in open channels and natural open channels. That's right. Areas of low slope, reversing flow, backwater conditions. Um, yeah. That, that, those are reasons why you might choose a Doppler. I, I, if you have a weir structure and it's functioning, if it's well maintained, um, maybe you want to use that. Um, again, no one size fits all, but these are the um, the capabilities we we can offer. I know in our services group, you guys provide tons of options on, on mounting. We've mm -hmm. got tracks and plates, so securing that instrument to the bottom and keeping that cable secure and anchored to the bottom of the channel is obviously important during the installation. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this is a nice summary summary slide of, of how the instruments work. Uh, one one uh, option I didn't mention is on the bottom here, you'll see our, our side-mounted system. Um, I talked a lot about the bottom-mounted system, but actually a lot of people aren't aware that there are side-mounting options. The Dopplers look out to the side, and of course, in stormwater conditions uh, or um, certain situations, you might that might be the only option for ease of access. Um, uh, they have uh, they have their certain time and place as well. So obviously, the one's more designed for your shallower or narrower channels, and the other one's designed for your wider mm -hmm. channels, so that you're looking at the again trying to get that entire cross section, whether you're doing it vertically or horizontal. That's right. 
So now we just want to talk about the overall solutions um, that, we, that we have and some examples of those. Um, first and foremost, having a, a data logger and allowing you that versatility when it comes to triggering the sample, whether you want to do it on rain, level, or a combination of those two, intensity, rate of change, uh, any of the water quality parameters, any of the flow parameters. Um, so we not only are we recording that data and sending that data, but we're also basing our sample events on that data and have the ability to adjust those however we need them for any application. Site deployment and equipment mounting, we're going to show some examples of that. Um, some of the challenges with solar powering sites and the, and the necessary uh, due diligence required there. Um, and then data delivery, you know, I think this is the thing that as we move into the, the more advanced cellular networks and so forth, we have the ability to look at this data now that it's on, out on the, securely out on the internet, we can actually see what's going on with our sites and automated, uh, have sort of an automated uh, a mechanism to get that data into our organization. And then, again, most importantly, the event right. sample and collection. And after we have that event and sample, we want to be notified of it. Let's talk about the data logger. Um, this is an example. This is our water log storm tree data logger. And again, we can do those key triggers such as rainfall intensity, uh, the level rate of change, the water quality instruments, or any water quality instrument. And, and again, we're not limited to any specific model or manufacturer. Um, and do that flow and flow proportional sampling um, using instruments like the IQ and the SL. Um, and then we can, again, we can use that basic code if we need to get into some more of the complex uh, triggers to, to create whatever algorithm or whatever logic that we need. Um, when we talk about samplers, this is an example of the ISCO, which is a manufacturer of, of uh, automated, portable, and permanent uh, refrigerated samplers. In this particular example, we use that left-hand uh, site again where we have the, uh, their model, the Avalanche, which is a refrigerated portable sampler. And in the right-hand picture, this is a, a site right before we're getting ready to ship it. It has that clamshell type enclosure with our uh, with our storm data logger in it. It's triggering the uh, the ISCO sampler. Um, when we look at the bottle arrangements in these samplers, um, we have discrete, which uh, usually is like 12 to 24 bottles. So that when we do take a sample, we're filling that bottle and then waiting for instruction to the next sequential sample. So those kind of use those terms interchangeably, but a discrete sampler would have a would have a sequential bottle arrangement. And then a composite sample, which is real common in the stormwater, would be a larger bottle, you know, one, two, or four bottle configuration. It might be a two and a half or four gallon bottle. And as we get a sample, we might partially fill that bottle and over time complete, completely fill it so that we have a composite composite weighted average of what's happening naturally in the environment. And we can do further testing especially for things like metals and pathogens and et cetera back in the laboratory. But again, when we talk about samplers, you know, mounting samplers in, the, in those enclosures are, are standalone, but we also have to factor in that that suction line has to be in situ to the, to the whatever your media you're pulling from. In this case, these are some examples of some uh, natural streams as well as culverts where we're mounting uh, the suction line. So the larger PVC pipe uh, down in that bottom picture is housing that uh, suction line. There's different materials depending on your, your regulation of how that suction line is manufactured. But at the end of it, there's typically a strainer to keep out that large debris. But this is some of our service team's uh, efforts out in the field to securely mount uh, that, mm -hmm. that, that suction line and secure it to the bottom so that it's covering that active level fluctuation so that when that event trigger is, is uh, initiated, that we get a good representative sample. Uh, that we've done all we can do to secure uh, the infrastructure there. Yep. So solar power and solar power budgets, you know, this is something we do with every one of the sites that we design and ship out as well as assist our customers with. Um, you know, sort of the main thing to look at in any solar budget uh, is how much power are you consuming, you know, and this is sort of a looked at over a complete day. You know, how many amp hours are you consuming and how much is the system? And then we look at second most important thing is how much we're generating. You know, and what I like to typically do is, is factor twofold. So if I'm if I'm consuming uh, two amp hours a day, I'd rather I would certainly prefer to generate four. That way I'm you know, we have a partly cloudy day, a foggy day, right. you know, some other nature so things aren't perfect. 
especially yeah. if there's going to be storm water. Right. There may not be sunshine. Right. And then thirdly, um, how much can we store, you know, to make it through those those weather events completely? So these weather events can last hours, days, mm -hmm. even up to a week. So I typically like to see about seven days of amp hour reserve to make mm -hmm. sure we make it through those cloud and storm events. And again, just as you mentioned, when it comes time to make a sample, having that power ready to go to do all the sampling and the monitoring we need is, is critical. Remote data delivery. So this is an important part, again, using that uh, sort of the advancements in the cellular technology is we're taking that storm data logger, uh, water log data logger, and we're equipping it with uh, several telemetry options or modems, such as uh, the cellular network using the CDMA protocol mm -hmm. that Verizon typically services or the cellular GSM protocol, which is typically in the U.S. Um, serviced by AT&T, but that's a very common protocol internationally with, with hundreds of providers probably. And uh, so between those two kind of covers most of the, the cellular options. We also have the ability um, to look directly to an Ethernet or a local area network if that's provisioned. Um, each one of these storm data loggers has a, uh, an embedded server uh, with a Wi-Fi connection mm -hmm. so that if you're in close proximity to the site, you can actually connect to the data logger without a cable yeah. and then configure that data logger or retrieve data just like if you were uh, doing it remotely or cable. And then design analysis, you know, not only are they primarily a level company, um, but they have actually more GOES modems installed in the world That's than right. anybody else, over mm -hmm. 5,000. So we can, we can utilize that GOES uh, telemetry technology that's provided by the government uh, to move data. Um, and then if, if we have several sites that are in close proximity to an office or, or, a, or an Ethernet connection, we can use spread spectrum radios to, to move that data. And then lastly, you know, as the alert systems become more popular for flood monitoring, people are including their stormwater sites on that network as well. So the remote user, user interface, we talked about the fact that the border log has an embedded Wi-Fi uh, server on it, and with that software, you know, you can look at the firmware directly. Um, but also, we have two services that, that are uh, adjacent to the Storm3 data logger. One is a cloud-hosted service. Um, it's a paid service that allows your data to go up into the cloud and have whatever level access that you want to use, whether it's for the public, um, for the private or the individual, and then different levels within that as far as administrator level, uh, user level, um, technician level, etc. And then we have a standalone piece of software if you're not interested in using the, the cloud service called Storm Local. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to set up your network of sites so that you're collecting directly to the site and bringing that data to your local PC or server. Yeah. Yeah, and all these options uh, have sort of an automated process where you can bring in the data. For instance, the Storm Central has an FTP um, site where that data is converted into an XML right. file so that you can pull it into your organization's database. Again, one of the most important things is that event notification. So after a sample event, typically on the regulatory compliance uh, stipulations, you have a certain amount of time uh, to not only refrigerate or potentially refrigerate that sample, mm -hmm. but also retrieve that sample and get it to right. the laboratory. So we want to be notified that an event has occurred. And uh, within the STORM software, whether you're connected through the Wi-Fi or through the Internet or through the cell network, we can set up these alarm uh, thresholds. So that once uh, a certain rainfall event, we can even be notified that events beginning and then being notified that the sample has been taken. Sure. So we can kind of have a heads up to what's happening in our site. Uh, another thing I did mention in the earlier slide, a nice thing about having that remote umbilical or connection is that we can make sure our site's diagnostics are nominal and, and, and operating properly. So then we do have a storm event, we've got ample power and that all the sensors and instruments are working properly. On the right-hand side, we just showed some examples of data display. You know, when you go to these, uh, especially the Storm Central website, and you want to look at data, it can be done in a, in a graphical form using line graphs, or you can generate reports. And again, that's either with the Storm Local being a closed system to the, to the organization, or if the venture is to put it out on the cloud. But again, that cloud can be scalable to being a private uh, host uh, right. system or through the, through the public access. Depending. Yeah. Access depending on your preferences. 
These are just some more deployment solutions. Um, upper left-hand corner there is, again, one of our platforms that our services group built for our customer. And on that is, a, is the, sort of the typical site that we've already illustrated several times in the presentation. The right-hand side is a bit smaller, but still housing that ISCO sampler, the data collection system and acquisition system. You can see the solar panel there to the right. And then in between those two is the housings for the water quality sensor. Right and the sampler suction line. Um, lower hand corner there is uh, some portable options we have. This was, goes back to that New York City uh, example where we're looking at water quality and some meteorological parameters. Mm -hmm. you know, meteorological is one other thing that can influence uh, 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 water quality and, and be tied to stormwater as well. Not just meteorological uh, rain gauges, but also wind speed, wind direction, sure. and how that affects the, uh, the estuaries. Right? And the right hand uh, example there, uh, right hand bottom is a platform we built in South Carolina. That's a that's a pretty elaborate platform. It's designed to get the technician out to the very end there so that he can service the level instruments. Um, we're also doing water quality and then delivering that data as well through the data logger and the telemetry system. Um, again, these are some portable systems. The unique thing about this system is that we designed it to be submersible, believe it or not. This, this was uh, a design requirement after uh, Superstorm Sandy in the New York City area. So these sites are utilizing some of our buoy technology, um, some of our submersible canisters that we typically put on oceanographic buoys, um, so that the data acquisition system is contained in a submersible housing. So if we have a storm surge that covers this box, everything continues to record. Um, we do have to wait until the, the storm surge resides in order to telemetrize that data to have a cell signal, but even the antenna itself is submersible. So this is a sort of a specialty application um, we did for a customer in New York. This is a good example of a GOES application. This is in Kansas City with the US EPA. And what we're looking at here um, is water quality, primarily water quality and transmitting that over the GOES network. So in situ there, in those channels that you see in the upper left, the upper right-hand side there is the YSI XO. So we're taking those water quality parameters continuously during non-storm and storm events and reporting those back to the central organization. Um, and you can see that that's about a network, I believe, of about 20 sites in the Kansas City area. And again, these are the more permanent uh, uh, platforms and installations. You can see upper right-hand corner there, that's a, a fairly vandal-proof example of a platform. Again, the platform is designed to get the technician out of the water as well as the sensors. Right. Um, in the lower left-hand corner there, we have one of our service guys putting in a concrete piling mm. to make sure that that platform is secure even during these flashy shifting right. events with the uh, sediment and the, and the uh, side of the, of the channel there. So we've kind of talked about lots of things today um, and lots of pieces of equipment. So YSI, Sontech, Design Analysis, uh, MJK, all fall within Xylem Analytics. And, and, and our goal and our here at uh, Integrated Systems and Sontech is to all work together and provide a sort of an integrated so solution. And so just to kind of recap, today we talked about the importance of having a rain gauge, the water log rain gauge, um, using level, whether it's radar, ultrasonic, bubbler, or pressure transducer. Flow. Sontech uh, IQ and the Argonaut SL. Mm -hmm. Water quality, the YSI XO and the YSI OMS. Mm -hmm. Multiple or single parameter. Correct. Um, and the data logger. Today we talked about the water log storm tree data logger and its ability to control the sampler. That's right. And then the sampler, the portable non-refrigerated and refrigerated samplers. And then finally, the telemetry option. It'll notify you that you've had a sample or that you have a certain threshold or alarm within your stormwater program. It might be a turbidity alarm if you have a construction project. Mm -hmm. But all that going back to your user interface. So this is the entire Xylem integrated stormwater solution options. And again, these are all scalable um, with, with multiple options on the sensor methods and technology. Yeah. Yeah. So Xylem Analytics is a much larger entity than just YSI, Sontech, uh, water log and MJK covers the entire um, water cycle and the water transport cycle. Mm -hmm. So atmosphere back to some of the agricultural practices, the energy production, 
uh, source water, wastewater, drinking water, and uh, through the industrial um, perimeter monitoring, and then even out to the coastal monitoring. We even get involved in marine transport uh, mm -hmm. and oceanographic mm -hmm. uh, monitoring, etc. So Xylem as a whole company is uh, certainly a, a resource leader when it comes to uh, water. Water in general, in general Absolutely. right. So we get involved in the transport. You know, companies like Godwin make pumps that, that move water. Um, and then we get into the treatment. Companies like Wetico make UV treatment mm -hmm. systems. And then today we discuss uh, YSI, Sontech, MJK, and Waterlog. And they fall into our analytics or our testing right. part. And then within that testing and analytic uh, division, we have several other uh, great companies. Right. So Xylem's tagline is let's solve water. So that's kind of, you know, that's kind of our high-level picture of what we're mm -hmm. trying to uh, accomplish in our vision as a company, and we are accomplishing it uh, very well over the last two years since we've been organized. Um, so we cover things into the 21st century like water scarcity, environmental issues. Um, I like to call it people pressure on the planet, but population growth <laughs> and uh, energy, uh, oil and gas, etc. Yeah, and we've talked about a few brands today, but um, the, the, the point here is that Xylem is is a, has many brands combining a lot of expertise in the water field um, to meet the, the needs that are out there. Right, right. So thanks for the attendance. Much appreciate everybody's yeah. time. And, and at this point, I think we're going to take some questions. We'll take some questions. One more thing I wanted to say was that uh, thank you for your questions. We'll get to as many as possible. But after the webinar, we will uh, get back to everyone. We'll send you an email with uh, this presentation. We'll send you some FAQs. We'll send you the answers to the questions that were asked today, as well as um, a PowerPoint version. And uh, Kevin wrote up a nice how-to white paper about stormwater as well. Yeah, I think that can be so, downloaded from YSI yeah. or Sontex. So, so there's going to be a lot of resources we'll send your way afterwards. Um, but with that, let's, let's take some of the questions. OK. You, we've got piles of these. We do. <laughs> Okay, can I get my site data into my organization's database? Um, to answer your question, if we were using the Storm 3 data logger, the way we would achieve that is that data would go out to an FTP site in an XML format. At that point, your database can grab or look at that site every time there's new uploaded data and pull that data, since it is in that XML format, into your organizational service or even a system like the LIM system that's designed for water resource and water quality. Uh, data. So here's, here's one about, about flow. How is the average velocity derived from raw velocity readings? How does shape of canal affect average velocity calculation? Uh, well, again, it, it largely depends on what technology you're using. I'm going to assume this question is related to the Sontec IQ. So, you might have noticed in the picture that the Sontech IQ has multiple beams that measure not only in the center line of an open channel, but out to the sides. So the average velocity is, is calculated from each one of those discrete measurement points throughout the water column. And from that, a, a picture of the flow field is developed through an algorithm. And that picture of the flow field gives us the flow. And from that, from that, that whole flow field, one single average velocity can be represented. Uh, and that's, that's the average velocity, or what we call the mean velocity. Uh, and then how does the shape of the canal affect the average velocity calculation? Well, within at least within the Sontec instrument, uh, one of the setup parameters is that you enter in a channel geometry. So if it's a, a box culvert, it's but you would enter in the, the dimensions of that. If it were a trapezoid, you entered in the top and the bottom uh, length. If it were an irregular channel, you would do an XY grid, or rather an XZ grid, and enter up to uh, 200 points or something to really define the irregular shape of your, of your open channel. Then the instrument will cut off the beams accordingly based on water level and channel shape. And then based on water level and that cross-sectional geometry that was plugged in, we can calculate an area 
And that area will change with water level because water level is constantly coming into the instrument. Um, so the shape of the, the canal uh, um, affects the flow, um, but raw velocity is still raw, and, and we collect that to the limits of the channel shape. It uh, can be a complicated um, it, description, but uh, that's in a nutshell. That's great. Thanks, Jen. This is a great question. How does, how does the storm data logger connect to the ISCO sampler? This is a basic question, but it's a great question because we emphasize uh, the not the one-size-fits-all approach. So not only can our, our storm data logger, or most data loggers, communicate to a sampler, but they can also communicate to other samplers. ISCO is certainly a great manufacturer, but other manufacturers like Sigma, et cetera. And the way we do that uh, with the storm data logger is that we connect through the sampler's flow meter input. So the, the, the data logger provides a excitated, you know, a slightly low power excitated pulse to that sampler to say that, hey, it's time to initiate, inhibit, or to let it know, uh, receive, let it know that it's taken a sample. So it's a very basic interface, and the sampler's job really is to just uh, produce that routine on demand when it gets that signal. So it's, uh, it, it's a relatively simple interface, and, and again, we can use multiple data loggers or samplers to, to, to be the controller or the sort of the, the logic device behind our sample triggers. What about measuring many storm drains at one time without permanently installing equipment? Um, I, I suppose it depends on the complexity of, of what you're trying to measure. Yeah, uh, I think some, some, a lot of the components are certainly what you might consider portable. Um, if you're measuring in a drain, for example, I, I mean, I would have to say that the Sontec IQ is probably one of the most portable yeah. flow measurement instruments out there. It's just yeah, it's just bolted into the bottom of a of a canal or a drain. I think the way I'd answer this uh, question is we could use the individual meters, whether it's an SL, an IQ, or multiple of those, and bring that data back to the data log, and then right. combine that if it's a combined system. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're bringing in multiple open channels, which is very common in a manhole. If you go down and look inside the uh, inverter culvert there, you can see there's contributors, small pipes, big pipes, all merging into one. Mm -hmm. So with having that centralized logic device, we can bring in multiple flow meters and then, and then combine that flow into one. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's kind of the person asked that question. Hopefully that, that's the right answer. Um, if those are at a distance from each other, um, then obviously just designing a system that uh, can post-process that data or having a, a radio link between the sites. That's right. Um, and, then, and then making it portable really surrounds the, the hardware and, uh, and, and then the mouse and how portable you make those. Uh -huh. yeah. I guess the bottom line is that it, it's doable. Right. If, these, if these many different sites are within a certain range, you can use one data logger right. to handle them all. Right. Or if they're not, you can connect them to a sense via, via radio link Correct. To yeah. the data logger. Yeah. That's great. Another good question. If I get an inch of rain in 15 minutes, how can I make sure I'm sampling at the right time after a big event? Well, I think at, at this point what you want to look at, and this is specific to each individual's watershed, is you want to look at some baseline data, uh, possibly before you set up your sampler. So you want to look at how rainfall intensity not only affects level, but um, what, what the lag time is between those two events. So you might have half an inch of rain in 15 minutes, but you may not have a six inch level rise That's right. for two hours. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, uh, most of these regulators and most of these people are trying to get that first um, sort of flushing of the system, uh, right. not, not too early, not too late. Mm -hmm. So looking at that baseline data and monitoring over time uh, can better help you with those thresholds and targets. That's right. Yeah. And one thing people often don't know either is flow, for example, can be a, a much earlier predictor of a level rise right. um, than, uh, or an indicator of an event earlier than the actual level itself. Right, so. right. Okay, looks like um, we're getting the signal. We have time for two more questions. Okay. What is the minimum velocity level or discharge for the IQ pipe? Can it be used for low discharge and dry weather? Um, well, um, we can take each one of these separately. Velocity, that's, that's actually the biggest advantage of a pulse Doppler is it 
there is no minimum measurable velocity. Um, it can measure forward velocities. It can measure no velocities. You should, should be reporting zero flow if there's no velocity, or even reverse. So um, I wouldn't say that there's a minimum measurable. Um, uh, the minimum level, the instrument needs about 8 centimeters or 3 inches of water on top of it. So depending on where you mount it in the channel or the pipe, you need about 3 inches of water on top of that for it to, to operate. And then discharge, similar to the way that there's no real minimum measurable velocity, um, there's really no minimum discharge except that you need, of course, you need a certain level. Uh, and there, uh, there's recommendation of a pipe diameter of at least 18 inches. Uh, just So based on those entering arguments, um, there, there might be a minimum based on those, but, but not, as, not as such. And certainly, like I mentioned, it, it can be installed in dry weather. The instrument knows whether or not it's in, it's in water, and it actually goes into a low, um, low uh, sampling state uh, until water is detected. And there's no damage that's done if they're out of water. The next question, do you have experience with wind interference with the radar downlookers? Um, how do you correct for wind or energy movement? Um, I, I personally have never had any issues with wind interference. Um, you know, one nice thing about the radar sensor is, is uh, typically when you're, when you're mounting over a structure, there is the potential for permanent interference, uh, I-beams, uh, uh, wood, uh, lumber, uh, if you're working on, a, like, for instance, a, a railroad trestle. Um, so that, that, that radar does have kind of a cone-shaped mm -hmm. signal, and you have the ability to map out any obstructions so that if you're looking at something before the water, you can actually ignore that and look at outside of that uh, footprint. Mm -hmm. um, the radar sensors inherently, though, come from a really uh, mission-critical uh, background. You know, they're used mm -hmm. in, in tanker ships and in real challenging environments because of their uh, advantages and not having too much interference uh, mm -hmm. unless you've got something solid or, or liquid in front of it um, and, and a period pretty dense at that you know historically with some maybe some of the ultrasonic sensors in the past this has been a while ago there'd be some challenges with steam and fog and etc but the radar sensor is certainly strong enough to pound through that and recognize if it's bouncing off of, of water mm -hmm. or a solid object and again if you're if you do have a solid object that can be mapped out mm -hmm. Kevin's, Kevin's talking about the radar level sensors. The, the question was sort of neutral. Um, radar velocity sensors, mm -hmm. and that's just one of sort of the inherent um, the limitations. Mm -hmm. if, if you think that wind is going to be a constant problem at the site, that's one indication that maybe there's um, a Doppler option out there that might work Yeah, better. I didn't even think about that. If you're looking at it from a radar uh, uh, open channel water velocity standpoint, mm -hmm. you know, wind certainly has a big... Uh, at least, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, you can have flow on one direction at the surface, and 90% underneath is going the other that's direction. Right. So that's, uh, that's a great question. I didn't, right. I didn't look at it that way, but uh, that's obviously one advantage of using mm -hmm. you know, something like this. Again, like we yeah. say, there's, there's no one-size-fits-all. It's right. highly site-dependent and organization-dependent. So at least, hopefully, we've given you uh, the ideas of the tools that are out there to make sure right. you're monitoring right. these. So with that... Hey, thanks a lot for joining us. Yes, thanks again. Feel free to email either one of us um, with any additional uh, questions, inquiries, or so forth. Again, really appreciate uh, Sontech hosting the, the webinar, and uh, much appreciate everybody's time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you.